who has the power to 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 write your story to educate you on your own story who has the, who has that power Welcome to Doha Debates. Each episode, we explore an urgent issue, present various sides on that issue, and try to see if at all a common ground can be found. We hope to bring you a conversation that's well-informed, spirited, but civil and respectful. I am Efia Pokuya, a broadcast journalist from Ghana, currently living in the United States. I've worked as a journalist for over two decades, covering national and international issues, including reporting on the unique cultural and economic value of African culture. So today we are asking, should museums be forced to give back artifacts that do not have proper provenance? Before we introduce our guest, first, a little background. The issue of cultural theft has been in the news more and more. Over the last year, American institutions like the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, the Denver Art Museum, and the Smithsonian have returned pieces of artwork to countries of origin. And in London, the Honeyman Museum and Gardens have agreed to return 72 artifacts to Nigeria that have been forcibly removed a century ago. While some museums have re-evaluated their collections to ensure each of their pieces have been legally acquired, others have pushed back, most notably the British Museum in London, which points to a national law saying it's illegal for them to return disputed artifacts. This includes the Benin bronzes from Nigeria or marble statues from Greece. At the center of the debate are questions related to ownership, colonial legacy, looting, and who has the right to care for the world's treasures. Joining us from Dubai is Chidurim Nwabani. Chidi is the founder of Digital Arts, Collective Luti, and works with digital repatriation artifacts. His collectives makes non-fungible tokens, or NFTs, on stolen arts. Proceeds from the NFT support contemporary African arts. Welcome to you. And in London, we're pleased to welcome Tristan Hans. He is currently the director of Victoria and Albert Museum, which boasts the world's largest collection of applied arts, decorative arts, and designs. The London Museum has over two and quarter million objects in its collections. Tristan has been a broadcast journalist, politician, serving as a member of the British Parliament. Welcome to you. And today, we're pleased to welcome in another voice from the art world, Sophia Carrera Wam. She's a curator, art advisor, and a gallery owner of Do Wam in London. She has been deeply involved in art education, works with a group called MASK, which stands for Mobile Art School Kenya. Welcome to you. While this debate is not in front of a live studio audience, we have some global listeners who are particularly interested in this topic, and we are going to hear from them a little later as well. Okay, let's get into it. And we will start off with you. Chidi, could you tell us about um, the NFTs and what, what it means for this discussion, the museum, the ads, and the return of them? Okay, so Luti, we work purely in, um, or well, not purely, but we work mostly in um, like, the digital restoration of 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 artifacts, um, and we do this in in many different ways through NFTs, through um, augmented reality, um, and uh, location based like uh, AR as well. Um, like our practice, or one our most most recent practice is where we physically go into the museums and we digitally heist back the, the artwork, right? So it's part of it is like a performance, which we then use to gain awareness on like the different uh, artifacts, but then those are turned into uh, NFTs, right? And the one thing that um, I want to say about NFTs is that it's the, the technology that we're using to provide a new way of looking at these like artifacts. It's the, the NFT stands for a non-fungible token, and it's that tokenization of the artifact, which brings in this element of, firstly, is it brings in an, another way of like provenance for this digital artifact, but then it brings in an element where we can now add in extra and install extra um, things that weren't able, you weren't able to do with the physical, 
right? So we actually view these digital artifacts as something new and very much um, separate from their physical, right? And now we're using this to, uh, well, with the sale of our, like di uh, dig every digital artifact we sell, we have the Looty Fund um, where 25% goes into the fund, which is given back to artists based in Africa. Uh, we we'll also have a petition that's going on right now for, uh, in, in conjunction with uh, Professor Monica Hanna, um, with the return of the Rosetta Stone, which uh, originally is called the Hajara Sheet. Um, so we recently did uh, a project on that where we used um, a technology called location-based lenses. So we went to the British Museum. We used 3D scanning technology, the same as like our digital heist, and then went back to the town of Rashid, which is uh, in Northern Egypt, and and digitally put back the Rosetta Stone in its an original original place, which is in uh, a citadel, which is based in Rashid. Um, so all of these is that we're trying to find new ways of kind of like leapfrogging this whole bureaucratic yeah. process of us having to like talk about these things and you know debate whether they should come back or not I, I like i said before i i believe that you know for for the most part the damage is done right with a lot of these so now we need to it's our job to especially as we're moving now into the digital age we don't want the same processes and the same things to be repeated when we go into the digital now we need to really own the story of how we're going to be reproducing these. Tristram, as the director of Victoria and Albert Museum, nobody wants to be accused of displaying stolen goods. First off, tell us the process of defining provenance and how your museum determines whether or not they should keep a certain object. Well, it's wonderful to be with you and thank you for um, inviting me in. And this debate around the return of looted or stolen artifacts um, has been going on in its modern form for a good 60 years. Since the early 1960s, uh, there have been strong arguments around the return of, of, of looted artifacts, particularly to sub-Saharan Africa, where, where so much of the cultural heritage uh, has been uh, taken. And the laws around this have changed over time within the United Kingdom. Um, the Victoria and Albert Museum, for example, in the mid-1960s, returned items to Burma, modern-day Myanmar, that were taken in the 1880s. Um, other items from the VNA have been returned to Ethiopia um, in the past. And at the heart of it is exactly what you say, the importance of of provenance, of understanding the origins of the collection, where these items came from, and the documentation and the archive surrounding it. And so within the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, we can trace whether these items were acquired, whether they were purchased at auction, whether they were gifted, uh, whether they uh, were items from the government, whether they were items that came from looted colonial expeditions in the past. And it's really important to my mind that we're transparent and open and scholarly about that process. So everyone knows where the objects are from. And then we can have the conversation about what should their future be. And in the UK, there are lots of museums who are involved in conversations around returning artifacts um, Aberdeen University, Jesus College, Cambridge, uh, the Horniman Museum and the return of the Benin Bronzes. But the British Museum and ourselves at the Victoria and Albert Museum are legally prevented by an act of parliament from removing anything from the collection. And so it's a political problem that will have to be solved at a political level as to whether, for example, the Elgin marbles could be returned or the Benin bronzes, or in the case uh, of the Victoria and Albert Museum, items which were looted in the past uh, from Ethiopia and Ghana. What we want to do at the VNA is, whilst this law is in place, begin a process of renewable cultural partnerships. So sharing these objects around the world whilst uh, adhering to the legal framework that we operate under, because we absolutely understand the sense of, of loss 
uh, the sense of moral outrage connected uh, to many of these items, and also now think that they should be vehicles for cross-cultural understanding, work on conservation, work on provenance, work on research. And those are the kind of partnerships we're seeking to build at the moment. I think I'll come back to you uh, on that um, work of cultural understanding, cross-cultural understanding of that. But Chidi, uh, tell us about your process, um, what your understanding of the process of determining whether a particular object meets your definition of being stolen. Because this is at the center of, of the issue. Because you are on the other side with uh, Tristan, and I know you spend a lot of your time um, highlighting stolen artifacts and selling them as NFTs. But can you briefly give us what your understanding of stolen objects are and what you think about this? Um, I think for for those items that we know, you know, 100 percent that are that have been stolen, um, you know, definitely I don't really think there's much of a of an argument anyway for us to to start with to say that these should be given back. It's more of a a discussion of how these should be given back and we can use our um, our own kind of creative brains to think of solutions about how these can be can be given back. Um, in terms of the ones that now we don't know or like the provenance is um, is unknown. These, I think, for those we had one thing that we do know is that they do not come from the country which they're situated in. So you know, then you have to look at these from like a moral like standpoint of what do I do with these items that I know are not from, you know, this particular place, um, you know, is, you know, exactly the country where they're from, but you don't actually know the exact person who, who owns them, or you don't know whether these were like gifted. And I think then you need to look at things from like a moral point of view of like, do you withhold those people who, actually own the cultural heritage of this those those items okay. so right, let me let me come to you um you work with a lot of um contemporary african artists and you've talked in so many ways about reclaiming what was stolen C- can you share with us your thoughts on this subject um what do you think yes of course and thank you for having me <clears throat> so i think we definitely need to embrace nuance when it comes to this question because while objects taken in the last few centuries from Africa, as we've just been discussing, and objects that originated thousands of years ago from no longer existent cultures, both of those could lack proper provenance, but one is clearly more urgent and of major significance to people living today. I also think our use of terminology is very important in this debate. To some extent, I feel like the word return that we're using here has a transactional feel to it, and it carries the implication that to return something is to negate any damage done and in a way to clear the slate as if the intervening period never took place. It also implies that a straightforward return is possible, which in many cases it is not. So cultures, landscapes, communities, traditions, and national borders all shift. So I think the question has to be bigger than should we just return things, but as well, how can we support the wider development of cultural infrastructures in a way that redresses imbalances? And that infrastructure doesn't just mean museum buildings, but also more collaborative programs, more digitization, more provenance research, more archiving, more community engagements. All of those would create the conditions for, as hopefully legal situations change in the UK, as Tristan mentioned, for multifaceted forms of restitution and reparation that include returns. Shouldn't we be solving the puzzle of how they were acquired? before we can answer the questions that you you raised in your earlier comment? Absolutely. So my background was in archaeology, and I also worked as an archivist, so I feel very passionately about this. The issue is, though, that objects can't speak for themselves. If we lose the context of how an object was found, it can be very, very difficult to retrace the steps. And I think this also brings us to the fact that there is an ongoing issue of the illicit antiquities trade for which London is a major hub. And every time an object loses its context and ends up in a new place or ends up in a museum, it can be very, very difficult to work backwards. But absolutely, we should be doing the research and we should be building stronger archives where possible. Tristan, let me come back to you. You raised the issue about cultural, um, I think the, the terminology you used was about the 
um, the opportunities that this, for instance, um, presents, that instead of just looking at the, um, the return, which Sophia has told us that there are problems to even using the terminology return, how about the, 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 the opportunities that it presents, that African culture has the opportunity to reach a wider marketing audience, a wider audience of people who don't have a clue about the culture, but by virtue of these artifacts being in these museums, they can have access to the culture and understand it. How about that? I, th I think this operates at a number of levels. On, on the one hand, there is a, a sense of, of justice, a sense of re return um, that, that some communities uh, feel for, for, for the loss of um, objects. Um, and it, in, in a sense, it's not up to museums to judge whether or not that's the case. I think what we can do um, is use these moments for richer and broader partnerships. And what's interesting about the return of the, the items from the Horniman Museum, the Benin bronzes from the Horniman Museum uh, to Nigeria, is that the deed of title changed, that the ownership changed, but very generously, the authorities in Edo State immediately lent the items back to the Horniman Museum. So these objects never left, in some cases, their, their case within London. And for the diaspora community, for the West African community in London, it was wonderful to be able to see the continue to see these objects, which were part of their diasporic uh, heritage and, and, and culture. But in those situations, know that the ownership belonged to the modern state um, of uh, of Nigeria, um, and obviously there are mm -hmm. you know complexities there around you know hi historic Benin. So you can build quite interesting partnership models that have the object at one level, but then exactly as we've discussed, conservation partnerships, curatorial partnerships, research partnerships around it. And these these objects, which can be the source of great fissure and division uh, between uh, communities and countries, can become these bridges uh, for richer cultural understanding. The only other thing I'd say is that it's really important within, within this conversation, we also don't lose sight of the fact it's wonderful to have museums full of lots of items from around the world. And that's very much the point, that people are able to see this relationship between cultures, this multiculturalism, this exchange. The, the tragedy and what we need to address is that there are too many, country, too many museums in the global south who do not have that range of collections within them, let alone items from their own communities and cultures. But let's Let's not, in this conversation, lose sight of the importance of people understanding the appropriation, the appreciation, the debt uh, that cultures um, owe to one another. And museums provide the space to think about that. Mm. Well, uh, Sophia raised an issue which was very important. It fits into what you were talking about, which was context. She raised the issue, once you take the artifacts from its cultural context, it loses its value. So even though you speak about this opportunity advantage, what Sophia is talking about is also a reality that once you've taken it out of its natural context, it, even when there is opportunity to use it for educational purposes, it's, it loses that bit of it. I, what do you say to that? I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting philosophical question because on the one hand, it can lose a cultural context in one area, and particularly for items of faith. Uh, that are no longer within a, a, a practice of faith, but it can gain a different relationship and a different understanding and a different role in conversation with other objects. And in a sense, this is a this this is a conversation almost about the Enlightenment and secular ways of looking at art and objects, uh, which within museums can, for some, feel quite kind of you know deracinated and secularized and and lack the the, the 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 kind of the kind of compelling feel of the initial object but we also know that they can begin different conversations with other objects and and i think this is a this is a you know 
um, a, a divide in opinion as to uh, as to the role of objects. So, for example, then I'll stop. There are objects which were purchased by very wealthy Americans from Britain in the early 1900s, which now sit in museums in America, which then are having a conversation with art from America and art from France made at the same time in an American museum. And in a sense, they're lost from the UK, but they're having another conversation in a different cultural field. Well, Chidi, let me come back to you. What do you, what do you think about the, the concept of um, the context? It was Sophia who raised the issue about context. But more importantly, when these uh, items have been stolen from the people, some of them representing the cultural value, the spiritual you know, value of the people, very important um, art have been stolen from people. Do you think restitution can can fix it? Reparation can fix it when when it's no longer in the context in which it originally was, or is lost is lost that the context. What do you think, Chidi? Um, in in short, I think no, no. I don't think it's um, I don't think it's possible. I I really believe that in you know the time where these artifacts have spent outside of their their home they the damage has been done you know let's just be let's just be serious about it it's like it's spent so it's spent so long outside of its home that it's now when they come back or when they're returned they come back of different meaning you know they come back of relics of colonialism the memories have you know kind of been tarnished of where they were originally from like some of these uh artifacts were used for for celebration were used in um different spiritual practices but they're coming back and also mind you they're coming back to a, a place that's changed a lot from the original home where it was was taken right they've been housed in this place called a museum where you think even the even the concept of the of a museum if we're talking about um if we're talking about specifically africa now that is a foreign concept. It's a foreign co concept of the museum. So it's like you're taking it from one one place where the powers, the power of the context of who gets to, you know, tell the story about these artifacts into another place, which is again a museum. Should they even be housed in a in a museum? I don't think so. I don't think that's the solution to take things from one museum to another. There's there's, I think we, and I for. For me, being able to work in the in the digital space, it gives me the opportunity to to look at this from a different perspective as well. I was in at the Pitt Rivers Museum not too not too long ago, just last month in Oxford, and I was look I was I I, I saw a lot of masks masks that were from like my my home, you know, masks that were from in in Abia State in Nigeria, and I was looking at them and the way that they were displayed, it was like it looked so foreign, like it looked, it looked so foreign to me. And I kind of was like confused. It's like, why would you uh, display like these items in this way? Right. The, a lot, it was um, for masquerade. And as you know, as a masquerade is something that's for, um, you know, that's used in like sp spiritual in in incantations of like the spirits, the yeah. deities and things like this. And it's like, it's just being displayed. You would never know that from the way this is being displayed, right? In the con in the context of a museum, it's not meant to be shown like this. So you, you completely remove the actual like meaning. Um, so yeah, I I think that. But Chidi, you have a point there. But you know the point that um, Tristram raised earlier: um, the museums are all about educating people helping people to open their minds to other worlds and cultures. And the artifacts and objects are great ambassadors of, of blending cultures and understanding different cultures. So he spoke about education, using that as a means of educating people from the other side of the world, that this is the culture of this other side. So I appreciate the points you raise about um, the, some of the object being displayed wrongly and, and, and failing to achieve the object of actually um, educating people about the culture of where the art is coming from. Sorry to interrupt. From the other, when you say from the other side of the world, you're talking from from educating people from Europe about the yes, Africa's from Europe stuff. about African culture. Okay. Yes. So why not get on a plane and come to that that place 
you can with that you're actually giving you like a healthy tourism can grow from people from those from especially from Europe coming to Africa not just for the kind of tour the most tourism that that uh, we may see which is um, okay for example they have they have zoos in uh, in in the UK right but for someone who really wants to see those animals they'll go on a safari and I know that in like my parents live in South Africa. I know that's something that's very popular in terms of tourism. Rwanda, Kenya, hugely popular. But people are not flocking to those countries to go and view the artwork and artifacts from those countries and paying in paying into the tourism of those countries, buying visas for those countries, which then, you know, that money filters down. Sophia, what do you think about this? Because he's raising a very important point. And you were the one who initially introduced the concept of reparation and restitution. I think it fits into what um, Chidi is saying, especially when he says that the artifacts also have a way of bringing capital funding to the African economies because you, you people will travel. It's part of the tourism. It's part of the culture of the people. So whoever wants to appreciate it must be able to invest in having that knowledge and education, which brings the capital, the money, the funding back into the African um, economies. Well, what do you think about that? Absolutely. I think I think that the economic argument is a really strong one in terms of return. I also think it can sometimes feel as if we're talking about maybe a few objects that two sides are really strongly trying to keep hold of. And of course, there are specific items and masterpieces that both sides agree are particularly special. But there are incredible statistics, for example, that around half a million objects are thought to have been taken under colonial rule and reside in Europe. So we should also be thinking about what percentage of those are on display. And is there not more than enough to, without doing something so radical as emptying Europe of artifacts that I agree with Tristram can, and yourself, that can, they can be great ambassadors, they can be great cultural learning opportunities. And I agree with the, both other speakers that objects are changed and modified by their ongoing life. And the fact that they've been part of museum collections cannot be eradicated from them now. But I do think there's an opportunity to find somewhat of a middle ground between both of them here. Tristram, let me take your, your comment on this one briefly. When does learning about culture and honoring its cultural heritage cross the line into stealing from a culture? Well, we, I mean, I, I mean, I, th I think going back to uh, Chidi's original uh, thoughts. We, when you do the provenance research, when you when you do the the kind of detailed historical investigation to where the items come from, you you can you can find um, how how they entered the museum and and in what form. And as Chidi originally said, that might well have been the 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 kind of rules of war of the time and and the ethos of the time. And now we take a different. Approach and obviously we've had international legislation surrounding uh, um, the, the the excavation of artifacts, as Sophia said, since nineteen the early nineteen seventies. Um, but I think appreciating um, a culture and appropriating a culture, it's a very very fine line to to draw. We we have, for example, within the Victoria and Albert Museum, this wonderful piece of Mexican pottery um upon which it's from the 16th century upon which is an image of the double-headed habsburg eagle now this is an eagle from the holy roman empire of northern europe and in mexico they came to know of it because of the spanish empire in central america and yet what the mexican craftspeople are doing is taking that European symbol and, in a sense, indigenizing it within Mexican craft traditions. And that is a story of appropriation and appreciation of, of empire and exchange and conquest. And museums tell that story. And so it's up to us as museums to be very clear about the history of this, but also appreciate, I think, the agency of artists and designers and makers who operate within these political contexts that we as a museum of art and design and performance, we also have to celebrate their work alongside thinking of the political context. 
Sophia, couldn't an argument be made that nothing of cultural significance be removed from his um, homeland? And what kind of object, say, in Nigeria, do you agree that, for instance, say, Met or Victoria or Albert should process? Or say, NFTs, we turn them into NFTs. Which ones do you think are permissible that we, we, we do that? Well, I do believe that particularly as a young person, access to other cultures is incredible and mind-opening. But I think those formative experiences shouldn't be limited to people who just happen to grow up in a European cultural megacity like I did in London, which is a point that Tristan made earlier about needing to kind of democratize and disseminate the prevalence of museums and access across the world much better than we're doing right now. I think ideally everyone would have the opportunity to view objects from other cultures that were well contextualized and that brought new conversations through their juxtaposition. That's not the reality that we're in today, but it is something that we could w work towards. And I do think that restitution, particularly when we're talking about um, colonization, is, is important. But I think, like I said at the beginning, that we need to have much more nuance in this conversation around which time periods we're talking about, what was the context of removal, what is the state of the existing collections and provenance research about it, are there multiple stakeholders who are claiming this item? There's so many questions that go into each case that need to be considered. It's also a huge amount of work and is being done on a case-by-case -case basis by thousands of museums. So inevitably, it's going to be a bit of a mess and it doesn't correlate that well or that easily to abstract conversations about the topic. Well, that, let, let's take a pause here and um, let me say that as part of our mission at the uh, Doha debate, it's not really uh, about finding areas where we disagree and making you know, a big deal out of that, but uh, more importantly about finding a common ground. Now let's talk about areas where you agree. Tristram, have you found any areas where you agree? I mean, I'm I'm very excited by Judy's work on NFTs. I think I think the democratization of um, of this of this heritage through digital forms is is um, is really exciting. And I think the the kind of the energy that comes from that is um, is really really interesting. Um, and and we're all we're all wrestling within in the museums between you know the 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 way in which particularly digital natives who are kind of you know, approaching the, the the collections and understanding the collections. And then we also feel that as a museum born of the colonial and imperial past, it's really important that people around the world through our, our web presence um, can access our collections and, and see something of, of what's in our museum. And, and, you know, the more innovative and exciting that is, the better, as far as I can see. Chidi, are there areas where you agree with Tristan or Sophia? Look, when, when you pose like the first question of should these um, items be uh, returned with no provenance and um, everybody's given like their opinions on that, I think, you know, loosely we all have agreed that yes, there should be some, <clears throat> there should be some way of return, right? And these items should be returned. Nobody, nobody is saying that, like, no, they should, they should stay where they are and they're, they're best kept, right? And so then that's where it's like, okay, the how do we do this? Is it yes, they should be returned, but now it's like how? You know, I have very, I have very, um, I have from my own perspective, I have, you know, uh, as uh, I guess a perspective that is shared by a, a, a lot of people who, um, are, are, you know, who see things the way that I see and from from where I'm from, right? I have a. Uh, it's not really. I don't really see it as a very unique uh, perspective on the way that these things should be should be done. Um, but there's there's not only one way for us to like create solutions, and I think the solutions come out from having these kind of conversations, so we can all be heard. Right. Sophia, let me come to you. Any agreements? I would agree with that completely. And I would also add that I think in the UK, one issue is the, I would say, alarmist and often sensationalist way that this topic is addressed. Um, I had a quick review of kind of recent headlines and 
there's statements about you know museums being destroyed by the idea of return and being empty and evacuated, which couldn't be you know further from what we're all suggesting and talking about here today. So I think we need those elements of discussion to permeate into the wider landscape, and then we'd be able to get more broad public support as well. Yeah. It's very important you raise the issue about public support because I mean, really, everything is, is is you know around the people who are the originators of these um, artifacts we're talking about. But let me come back to you again, Tristan. Your museum, the Victoria and Albert, as we mentioned, possesses over two million objects, only a tiny fraction of which ever gets displayed. Why then, if you have all these cultural artifacts? Why not send them back to their countries of origin so that they can be better appreciated? Because I think there's an important point here, which is that in an age of growing populism and nationalism and chauvinism, it's really important that communities know as much around the rest of the world and the brilliance of art and design uh, from Southeast Asia, from Southwest Africa, from Northeast Europe. The, the point is that if you think your country only produces culture or your country uh, is uh, the, the, the exceptional, in the long run, for our education understanding, that's really, really bad news for our, our politics. The, the challenge is not to take everything foreign out of museums and just have museums of England or museums of Ghana or museums uh, of Pakistan, it's to ensure that the circulation of objects is much more equitable so that we in the UK are sharing, you know, Wedgwood China and Turner pictures um, with museums or centres for, 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 for university centres for learning in the global south much more effectively so you've got this circulation of objects and it was powerful to hear about that sense of loss which i completely uh, a, a acknowledge because it is a great privilege for those who come to the victoria and albert museum to see all of this and as artists to be inspired and the the artist sophia is working with um in 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 in, in many african countries don't have that available to them in, in the collection. So that seems to me the challenge. The answer is not to strip everything foreign from any museum, or it's it's to think about how we share objects and whether it's Chidi's work in terms of the digital space, uh, whether it's the work we do in terms of sending exhibitions around the world, uh, having cultural partnerships. That's the, the challenge, um, it seems to me. Um, and, you know, it's called the Doha debates this. And if you see the museums they're building in Doha, whether it's the Museum of Islamic Art, whether it's the Lucelle Museum or Orientalism, all of that is about exploring these East, West, North, South cultures. Um, and that seems to me where we should be putting our energies. Tristram, you have said that the European Museum have a nuanced purpose and shouldn't automatically bow to calls to return artworks plundered by the 19th century colonizers. Can you explain that further? I mean, uh, I, I think there are strong cases for return of objects, but there, there are also strong cases for retaining objects, particularly with growing multicultural and diasporic communities around the world. Um, and to go right back to where we began this really interesting conversation, it's about understanding the provenance and history of the object, because even if objects were acquired during a, a period of European dominance, that doesn't mean they're all looted or stolen. At the moment, we live in an era where the great Gulf powers in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Qatar are buying up collections around the world. We live in an era when China is buying up material around the world. There's an imbalance in power between, as it were, modern UK and modern China, and that's reflected in the power and might of Chinese collections and museums. And so it doesn't mean everything is being looted or stolen. It does mean there's a power imbalance 
So all I'd say is that that period of, of European dominance in the 19th century, where there are collections connected to it, let's let's be clear and transparent about the history of that and then be, you know, really collegiate and generous and scholarly about how we, we share these collections and in some cases return these collections in the future. Okay, as part of our debate, we also have our global listeners who have been observing the back and forth and we want to bring them in into the conversation. Both were chosen because they care deeply about art and art education and how it's being portrayed globally. First, I'd like to welcome Mutinta Masuwe. She's been listening in on this conversation from Zambia. Welcome to you. Please ask your question of the panel. Greetings, my name is Mutinta Masuwe. I'm from Zambia. I'm the founder of an initiative called the MCOVER Solution, and I am an educator. I come from a place called uh, Kawe Central Province, which is a central uh, town within Zambia. It was formerly known as Broken Hill, where we have uh, the first uh, traces of man to be located. His fossils were located in Central Province, Kawe. So um, the question that earlier was, uh, of course, the, the answer that was talked about regarding uh, the question that was asked over why should we have our artifact being displayed in a foreign museum instead of them being displayed in our own museum within, uh, of course, Africa. I find it not to make sense because the Broken Hill skull was taken away from Zambia and it is in Europe right now. As an educator and also growing up as a child, we only read about it in books. And then the speaker mentioned about it to say that it is a source of education. How can it be the source of education to people who are not closer to it and yet they get to see it physical? Yet us who are who regard it as um as uh, we regard it as uh, it is our ancestor. We can't. We just read about it in books. We can't even have access to it. And looking at us countries to be least developed countries, it will be a source of tourism and a source of revenue for us. So my question is: Is it fair? And why should it be displayed and it being the source of education for other people and not us who are closer to it? For it is our ancestral um, heritage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mutinta. Uh, uh, Tuli, would you want to pick that? I think earlier you made reference to parts of the questions that um, Mutinta was, is, is asking. Yeah, I think this really uh, is, is something that concerns um, like power. Who has the power to, to, to write your story, to educate you on your own story? Who has, the, who has that power, right? If it's something that's really uh, that's that's really like prevalent on my mind because with what we're doing with the digital, we see this as a way of like taking back power, taking back control, you know. Because in the digital realm, we still don't have some of the the old hangups from colonialism that we do have in 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 the in the physical. Um, so I think we really need to change this this uh, like notion of who has the power to tell. The story because even when like for example the uh, artifacts maybe they get sent they get returned back still you know the people that are educating us back on our own artifacts they're the ones that hold the power the one that the one that the ones that are telling the story right mm, mm, mm. Uh, Chidi, very important and, and that's what mutinta was um raising so sophia let me ask you mutinta raised uh, ask a very important question once why should other countries get the benefit of having the knowledge and education when the people who are the original owners have to read it in books. And that's what um, Chidi is saying, that once you take it, it's an act of power. You've taken the power of education, the power of understanding their culture from the very people who are the owners of that power. And they are powerless. So once it even comes back, according to Chidi, it loses the power, that original power that I guess, well, what do you think about what Mutinta is talking about? I think that voice is incredibly important and I hope that lots of people hear it because it really conveys what also can get lost in the conversation about objects, which is the 
huge ongoing significance, the active sense of loss, the inability to form and place cultural identities and one's past, you know, things that museums obviously care about, but people living their lives without access to important cultural artifacts and only being able to read about them, or as Chidi just said, not even read about them because they don't speak the language, I think it's hard to argue that that's okay. Also with us is Miriam Rekik from Tunisia. She is particularly interested in the role of museums in educating the public. Miriam, what is your question for us? Now, the use of NFTs and other digital assets has raised important questions, especially in the artwork field. Now, concerning those in relationship with cultural appropriation, cultural presentation, or anything that has to do with ethics and politics in a certain country or culture. When these images, symbols, or elements are outside of the digital artist's own culture, this may raise several questions. For example, there have been several instances where digital artists used symbols or elements from a certain culture without proper consultation or acknowledgement for that culture. Now, here's the whole context, but my question is, what are the ethical or the cultural considerations that museums play in that? Also, how can museums work with indigenous artists, let's say, to avoid divulgating a misinformation or something that is so wrong about a certain culture? Thank you. Thank you very much, Byron. Anyone wants to pick up um, the question and answer it? I mean, from the museum's perspective, our our role, in a, in a sense, is to provide sources of inspiration for artists. Our our, our role with our you know we have sixty five thousand objects on display within uh, the museum at any one time, and and really we we think our job is to be available for artists and designers and NFT innovators and entrepreneurs to use this collection to be inspired to create their own work. And in a sense, it's it's not for us to limit what symbols and images artists feel they should use. Um, and I think it, it is really interesting in, in today's conversations that people are much more nervous about feeling they have appropriated a culture or misused a symbol from one context to another all we do as a museum is provide a source book and hopefully some context and understanding around those works of art that then the artist uses is in in the creative way and it's but it's, it's definitely in Sophia but it's probably more you know closer to this than me it's you know I I think creatives now are more nervous than they might have been in the past for good or ill about drawing upon other cultural traditions. Sophia, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? I would say almost conversely that I work primarily with Africa-based artists who the main way they tend to show their work to the world as emerging artists is online. And there are often cases of full-on copying and recreation and people don't think that they will be found out. But I had one instance where my gallery partner walked into a gallery in London and saw an exact painting of one of the photographers we work with who's based in Nigeria's work. And presumably that artist didn't think it would ever get back to him. But these issues have actually come up a lot. So I think in this digital age, it's actually harder for direct copyright theft in a way to go unnoticed. But I agree that we have new and exciting avenues for kind of collaborating and exchange across countries at the same time. So so the, then the NFTs can be a threat to because of the scenarios you you you're painting are they a threat to the African artists you present you represent? I personally see NFTs as an opportunity. I think it has fully unlocked possibilities of ownership of digital art. I think the exciting aspects of provenance that Chidi mentioned as well. You know, lack of provenance is something that anyone who's worked in the museum or cultural sector has wrestled with and wished were more clear. And with NFTs, that is totally kind of blown out the water. So for that reason, I'm excited about it. 
Sophia, it appears to some people that there's a hidden conversation and the current to all this issue, which is colonialism, colonial legacy and racism. It seems like um, there may be w exactly what is wrong with this. Uh, Chidi hinted uh, on, on, on parts of it talking about power. And once you take the power from the people, um, then you take everything from them. It, 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 people have said that there's a, there's a conversation that the global north museums are better custodians of the art and culture than the global south. W what do you think? Do you agree? I mean, I think that was the argument used in the 1960s when there was the last big push for restitution of objects to Africa alongside independence movements. Um, I think that there's a huge push towards building more museums in Africa. And I think, as Tristan even mentioned earlier, we're not in the position when we're talking about stolen objects, I don't think, to be making a judgment call on whether cultures are able to look after their own objects within reason. Okay. So, Chidi, let me take your thoughts on that. You know, you raised an issue about some of these artifacts even losing the history, where they came from. They came from cities and towns, you know, for instance, Ashanti Kingdom, and part of that kingdom has lost that history, the venue, the, the locations, you know, ruined by war and other things. Do you think that, as I asked um, so far, the actual hidden objective or conversation is colonial legacy and racism? From my point of view, the the structures of the museum, I believe, are not the structures where these artifacts should be should be kept. Because from their original form, they were not kept in museums. They, were, you know, the museum was not the place where where they were housed, where they lived, and you know, a lot of these artifacts were were in the possession of of peoples for hundreds of years. You know, happily there for hundreds of years before um, they were taken. So, um, what was happening then? You know, um, we need to think about perspectives when we're looking at these and having these conversations. We have one perspective, which is, I guess, is more of like the Western perspective on this. Of that, you know, we take we take our artwork, we take our history, and we put those in museums. But there's another perspective on this about what should happen to artifacts and where we should house them, right? And what should be done with those? Um, I, I recently, um, I recently saw, uh, like in my research, you know, someone who's looking at ways of creating, like, somewhat of like a mobile museum and using structures that you see um, that are very familiar to people who um, who live in Ghana. Um, you know, taking some of these like the kind of uh, local shops that you see and using them as like places for like artifacts to like modernize the way that we, you know, look at history, you know, taking this whole, that's taking the same like concept, but bringing it into the modern day and something that's more relatable because I don't, what I don't think is relatable is this, you know, the cold glass, glass uh, boxes with, white walls and you go in there even when you land into a museum it's uh you know your your whole effect the way that you the way that you form and everything changes in that whole structure this is not the structure where the uh, i mean for the most part for the most part a lot of, a lot of these should not be housed in museums and we need to start thinking about new ways and creating uh different options that reference their original form Chidi, I don't want to cut you, but Tristan uh, raised this issue about balance, that it's not just about just, you know, taking everything away from the Global South Museums and taking, what do you think about that balance? Is that a good no, option? I, I, I agree as well. I think there's, there definitely needs to be a balance. It's not about, every, it's not about just taking every, it's not about taking everything and then just send, sending it back. But it's also interesting that we, we start this conversation of balance with the majority of artworks being in Europe already. It's like, why can we not have this conversation about balance with the majority of them being in in Asia, Africa, South America? Tristram, can you offer your final thoughts? I, I, I think that, that that point about balance is is is, is so well made. Um, and I think what, what we need to do from, from a museum perspective um, is to make sure we're we're working with um, 
artists and um, you know digital innovators, but the the curators, the conservatives, the archivists um, um, ar- around the world to to build up those partnerships over the uh, over the long term. Um, and I think for for museums like ourselves with collections, you know born of, of the last 150, 160 years through colonial and imperial histories. Um, it's absolutely right that that we're on the front foot uh, on this, not dictating the terms of the conversation, but being proactive around researching our collections uh, and thinking about how we share them more widely. Sophia, what are your final thoughts? I think it's incredibly positive that we're wrapping up this discussion with this idea of balance and one in which we have on we have comments about not bringing everything back but also bringing some things back on both sides and i think that will lead to a place where more people have access to their own cultures but also continue to and for some for the first time have access to other cultures which i think requires more international museum collaboration and also chile's ideas around non-traditional museum structures, which will reach millions of people who would never enter a museum in its traditional Western sense. Chidi, any final thoughts from you as well? Yeah, no, I, I definitely I definitely agree with that. And it's um, the, like the balance, the balance like has to come. I, again, I'll, I'll reiterate, like, I don't believe that it's like everything should come back but we sh- we also just need to take into consideration like the damage that's been done on um on like a set on a sentimental value and i think one of the the first things that needs to happen is a sincere apology you know let's just because there's conversations that happen within you know the the within the african community with the within the the uh, the diaspora of these things and you know, there it always comes from a, a, a fact of you know these people know that it's been stolen, and no one's really saying it. It's like we're saying it, but no one else is saying it. So I think we just need to like clear the air. Everybody have a sincere conversation and just say, look, we apologize. And then you know, once we accept that apology, then we can move forward on. Okay, this is how we are going to like share these artifacts, knowing the truth about them, right? My thanks to all our guests today, Chidrum Ngwabani, Tristram Hans, Sophia Carrera Wam, and thanks to all our debate listeners. Uh, Mutinta Masowe from Zambia, Marian Rekik in Tunisia. Thanks for listening to Doha Debates. I've been your host, Efia Fokia. Doha Debates is a production of Qatar Foundation. A podcast is produced by FP Studios and Doha Debates. Our producers include Daniel Dazi, Rosie Julian, Claudia Tetti, and Katrin Dermondi. FT Studios Managing Director is Rob Sachs. Our executive producers are Jafed Weeks, Amjad Atala, Jiga Meta. To learn more about Doha Debates, please head to dohadebates.com where you can find out more about our other podcasts, short films, upcoming events, and more. And please, if you like our podcast, please follow and share for your reviews. Thank you.